Point is, the end result is the same. Duty calls. I have searched the world over before. That is so cool. You guys all just have this really tight bond. Just call me the computer whisperer. He seemed so nice and warm. You don't want to come back to my place? The smell makes me nauseous. And I thought it was going to be a slow night. It's fucking fantastic. I love that sound. Can we go now? Welcome to Beer with Buffy. I'm Josh. And I'm Rex. And today on Beer with Buffy, we're going to be reviewing Season 5, Episode 17, titled Forever. 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 <laughs> if you didn't do it, I was gonna. <laughs> that will never. Ball not dropped. Ain't no that... balls dropping over here. We are five years old. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Would you like a s'mores? Uh, some more what? Exactly. I haven't had anything. <laughs> da, 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 da. Hey. Oh, cheese it's Christ can crackers and stuff. Did you know Christ is in fact a cracker? Is he? I'm still going to make that Halloween costume someday to prove it. <laughs> so yeah. Or I'm just going to talk about it. Forever. Dude, you fund it. I'll make that goddamn costume for you. Done. <laughs> Fucking thank God, because, you know, I tried to shop out stuff to put it together, and uh, I just, I couldn't find anything I liked. No, I, I have I have a really solid idea for it. <laughs> By the way, we're talking about Cheez-Its Christ. Yes. I, a Halloween costume by Joshua King, and now also Rex Hansen. Hey, and your hair is getting long enough again. Written by Joshua King, produced by, well, also produced by Josh King, <laughs> built by, directed by Rex Hansen. Yes. We're going to have credits on the back. <laughs> Actually, yes. We could put it in the ingredients. In, yes, exactly. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> and hey, I can do the graphic design for this easy. Oh my God. The ingredients should be like how much felt and thread <laughs> and glue and printer ink, etc. Yes. went into it. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I have so many ideas now. Um, under, oh, like I needed a new fucking project. Under sodium, put um, blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> oh man! I... So today we're uh, we're drinking Jameson with Reed's zero sugar ginger beer. Yes, my my ginger beer of choice. It's muy you know, delicioso. I, the you know the store was actually out of of this stuff for like two weeks. Uh huh. And I ended up actually buying some of the regular that has, like, cane sugar in it. Oh. Dude. Dude. I can't even drink the shit anymore. Right. Like, it, I, it makes me feel so bloated. It was... Oh, when I first started drinking this, it was because I was on a diet. But yeah, once you go read zero, you can't go back. You know, maybe it's not a clever rhyme, but shut yeah. up. I mean, well, I first started drinking this shit when I was on a diet, and then, like, it was weird when I first started drinking it, but I got used to it, and now, like, with sugar, it's weird. And yeah. the, the thing I love the most about this, and the most unfortunate thing about this is... Is that you're not getting paid for how much you talk about it? Also true. <laughs> um, I would, I would absolutely love if they sponsored me. I've actually had oh, correspondence know. with them on I know. Facebook. This isn't the first time we've discussed this. <laughs> but anyway, my point being is that uh, the absolute best thing and worst thing about this ginger beer is I literally can drink a ton of it. I have sat and drank six of these in a day, and it's so easy to do, but they're not cheap. Only six? <laughs> Wuss. I mean, I'm just not that thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> He hydrates. He hydrates real well. Well, uh, today on Beer with Buffy, welcome to Bad <laughs> Wine Tasting with Bad Wine with your host, Josh. This again? That's me. So today's Bad Wine is called Rex Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you done this one before? You know what? I sure hope not. <laughs> because there's a... It's... Mascot is a giant rooster, or rather, a cock. Basically, if you translate a loose translation of the name of this wine... No, I did another one that also had a, a chicken or a rooster on it. It wasn't this one specifically. Okay. But a loose translation of Rex Goliath 
with a rooster on the front of it is you gigantic cock. So I can be comfortable with that notion. If you excuse me, I'm going to pour some of your gigantic <laughs> cock into my goblet. <laughs> and then I'm going to gobble your cock. <laughs> some great big King Rex cock right into my oral facial cavity. <laughs> You know what? It tastes like an $8 wine. <laughs> oh, bad aftertaste. I don't know what they fed that cock, but... I think it needs to stay away from processed foods. There it is. That's my review of Rex Goliath Wine Cabernet Sauvignon. The giant 47-pound rooster. Wow, that's a big fucking rooster. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think you'd be too opposed to that. So, uh... <laughs> I, I assume you have your phone up so that you can uh, uh, fucking doodle-doo real quick? I, I'm going to read off the list of executive doodle-doos once, once I catch my breath here. If you can, then do. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> All right. While Rex is catching his breath, God damn. Uh, we describe uh, fucking a doodle doo as executive Patreon supporters. Yes, yes, yes. Our list of executive doodle doos are as follows: Kristen, Dulcinea, Rachel Gregory, Rachel Doodle Doo, D. Scharinghausen, Club E. Seal, Mister Tabalicious, Sandra Craig, J. Sommer, Christina, Catherine Parkinson, Karen Moon. Chris V. Man, Lee Rye Breadcrumbs. <laughs> <laughs> did did he just go in? Did he? Did he just shit? <laughs> oh, sorry, Leroy, Lee, Leroy Jenkins. Not Scarlett Choi, Janella Lendauer, bad at changing their name. Heaps, Andy Burgess, K. Fro Carl Gnome. <laughs> Father Big Floppy Halibut. Big Floppy Halibut. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Methuen DeBurr, Kelly MC, Jesse Rain, and Carrie Phillips. Thank you so much. Without all of you, this show literally is impossible. I think we need to oh, ask man. Father DeFinistrato why are our Patreons changing their names? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume that his answer would be for the halibut. <laughs> For the hell of it. Uh, it sounds like hell of it. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, I know. I get it. That's <laughs> a very bad pun. <laughs> it's a very bad pun. All right. Well, we don't have any voicemails proper to do. Um, sorry, K Fronome, Crystal River Sam, Carl, Madam of Many Monikers. I'm adding that officially <laughs> to the list. <laughs> uh, you you did send us a couple of voicemails uh, briefly. I would like to say I am completely on board with pretending that Sonic the Hedgehog two does not exist. And thank you for informing us. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I might give it a shot. Right? Yeah. Well, at least we know the animation is better than the original. I mean, the first one was not bad. The original original that didn't actually get released. Right. The yeah. the first movie though wasn't bad. Like, it wasn't anything oh, it, uh, spectacular. But. It, it, the story was fucking awful. Yeah, but it was a... It was so stupid. Jim Carrey was the only thing that made it okay. But it was... It was okay. But also, thank you, Crystal, for informing us that Jim Carrey was in a tribute, or whatever you want to call it, about... Uh, what's his name that died? Uh, Bob Saget. Bob Saget, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that existed, and I'm going to check it out, because uh, I was a big fan of Bob Saget back in the day. I didn't hate Bob Saget. I, I was sad to see him go, definitely. Never was a big fan of Full House. I watched it growing up, but I think it's cheesy shit now. See, I grew up on... Uh, we used to watch... My family and I used to watch family home, home videos. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did that like... Show, I did like that. I hosted that for a good long while. I like that as well, definitely. Well, that's fair. Um... So, no voicemails proper, but uh, no new reviews either. Yeah, 
So if you want to help us out on that front, definitely hop onto iTunes, give us a review. We'll give you a free sticker, and it also automatically enters you in a drawing to eventually have a chance to win a free hoodie. Yep. There's proof. Get on our Facebook page. Our winner posted a picture of it. They say it's great, because it is. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, once we get up to 75 reviews, currently we're at 57 um every that's not very many left every reviewer that's written an actual review is automatically entered into that drawing only thing that disqualifies you is not writing a review and only hitting the stars or having already won and there's only like two people or really only one well, that's won the hoodie uh contest oh, we yeah, did a couple of correct. t-shirt drawings correct i yeah. think i want to reset that anybody that hasn't won the hoodie is still available to win the hoodie yeah, I can, I can agree like just with that. Just because they want a t-shirt doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to win a hoodie. Right, right. Anyway, so there's that. Do that. That's the thing. That's the best way to help us. Number one best way to help us. Review us on iTunes. Thank you very much. It does things to the algorithm. No, it really does. Um, it every, fucks that algorithm right in the doodle-doo. Every single time we get a new review, there is a noticeable change in our views. They, they go up slightly for a while. Every single time. That is true. It puts us out front for a minute. So keep them coming. Ah, uh, yes. And thank you so much to everybody who already has reviewed us. Everybody else, you're a goddamn freeloader. <laughs> and we see you. And we hear you. Neato. Am I right? Or am I right? Or am I right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> God damn it. I don't know where you're going after this, but can you call in sick? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Groundhog. That, that took me a second. Sorry. Yeah. Like it, it was right there in my in, <laughs> in the forefront of my mind, but I I just I've only got like three movies that I reference: Groundhog Day, Ace Ventura, and I don't know, probably something else. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get on with this. I think we're, that's the rest of the opening. We're on to the mom synopsis, right? I thought you'd never ask. I mean, I didn't ask anything. I I made a statement. I hate you, <laughs> Joshua. Speaking of people that hate me, <laughs> Joshua, what are you doing, Joshua? Bringing you back from the dead. Now shut up and hold still. But I'm not dead yet, Joshua. Operative word, yet. But how can you resurrect me if I'm not actually dead, Joshua? Well, let's call it preventative maintenance. Oh, isn't that sweet? You're trying to make me live forever because you love your mother so much. Isn't that right, Joshua? Let's just say denial ain't just a river. Really? I thought it was a river, Joshua. Sheesh, you learn something new every day. Nope. Just something they made up to scare little children into being Christians. Like the Gora demon. Totally fake. That's a very large egg you have there, Joshua. <laughs> Did you get that from the grocery store? That's none of your Goram business, and I'll thank you to stay out of my personal affairs. Well, if you want to make an omelet, you've got to break some eggs, right, Joshua? Don't talk to me about omelets. You have no idea what I've been through. <laughs> Can I have some of your omelet, Joshua? No! Get your own Goram omelet! Like Dawn did on today's episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer! Because she's feeling particularly shitty and doesn't want to be at home anymore, so she stays with Willow and Tara after Joyce's funeral. They tell her they can do whatever she wants to do that night out of pity for her grief because she's taking it really hard. Well, Dawn's group activity of choice is necromancy! Tara shoots it down hard, but Willow seems more amenable to the idea, even if she's also saying no. Next day, she leaves a book, The History of Magic, hanging off the shelf for Dawn to find and lead her in the right direction to the darkest, most forbidden magics imaginable. After lying and tricking Giles and a little help from Spike and some weird old creepy demon dude, Dawn gets all the ingredients and know-how that she needs to drag Joyce's screaming mommy soul back from the ether. <laughs> Willow and Tara realize the book is missing from their shelf and Dawn might just be crazy and smart enough to try something stupid. They warn Buffy via a marvelous invention of Alexander Graham Bell's, you may have heard of it. 
<laughs> the telephone. <laughs> she catches Dawn just after finishing the spell, and they have a nice productive argument about grief, fear, and the integrity of Buffy's love, while Joyce's rotting corpse paints the town red with her blood and lands on their doorstep only moments later. Dawn hits the cancel button, and they go back to the lameness of having to grieve and accept shit. The end. Ladies, gentlemen, spiny-headed little creatures. As soon as the sun goes down, 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 down. As soon as the sun goes down, 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 down. Competition is a beautiful thing. Boots here. Something occurs to me, Josh. Yes. How many episodes of have we done now of the podcast i don't i don't, I don't, the, I don't I, if i had to give a rough guess 150 so about 150 and you've you've done the mom voice in at least 140 well at least 100 of them at least 100 of them there if, were quite a few where i did the dad voice instead yep, yep. there were so, a couple crossovers where i did both yeah yeah so you, you've done the mom voice in a hundred synopsises what voice is he talking about joshua shut up <laughs> <laughs> that's probably enough uh material to use to synthesize it <laughs> <laughs> and we could like make it a gps or something run it through an ai yeah oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what a marvelous age we live in <laughs> yes do that please because like and then charge money for it no i just had this really really hilarious idea mm. Of us figuring this out, figuring out how to do this, and and making like a an at home like assistant thing, of course, and then giving it to your mom. <laughs> Wonder how long it'd take her to figure out that it's me. <laughs> I don't. I don't think she would. I. That's the thing. <laughs> if we synthesized it, it wouldn't be your voice. It would be a synth. A, sila- a simulacrum of your voice, essentially. So, like, it, so what what was that word? A simulacrum. A simulacrum. Yeah, it, 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 human like. Is is the word itself simulacrum or yes. a simulacrum? Simulacrum is a the word. space simulacrum. Yes, correct. An simulacrum. Uh, it, that's wrong grammar, but yes. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Anyway, the point is, is I I don't think it would quite sound like you. <laughs> you know what else is wrong grammar? What wrong grammar? Well, yes. <laughs> that grammar is incorrect. <laughs> but I, I just think it's way too much work for the joke. But the idea of it is hilarious to There's me. no such thing as too much work for a joke. <laughs> I mean, Honestly, the more work for the joke, the lamer the joke needs to be. And that makes it funnier. Yeah, that that's fair. Um, I, I can... But still, it's an art. There's there's no science to funny. Yeah, yeah. I anyway, mean, we, we ought to get on with this episode. Ought to um, indeed. We're Hold already, open. Yeah, we're already, shit, 20 minutes into the fucking episode. That's fine. Uh, we open into a dark and eerie scene where there's a lot of caskets, and, and Buffy's going around looking at them. You know, and, she's Vampire Slayer. Yeah. Of course she'd be looking at caskets. Yeah. She does that every day. It's like she's shopping for fruit. <laughs> but it turns out she's not actually hunting anything like it is set up to make us believe she's actually shopping for a casket for Joyce. Hmm, this gourd looks large enough to stuff my mother's corpse in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Gourds aren't fruit. I'm sorry. Are they? I don't fucking know. <laughs> I dare say this tomato sure drips a lot of red. I don't, I don't think gourds are fruit. <laughs> Christ. Rex is looking up if gourds are fruit, everybody. Uh, It is a fruit. Gourd is a fruit. Yes! The joke works perfectly. So, Dawn is having a little bit of trouble coping with the idea that Joyce doesn't get a say in the casket and uh, that she has to be in it forever. Personally, I don't think she'd mind being in a sh- being buried in a shipping crate. Neither I mean, would I, because I'd be dead. Yeah. I've never really quite understood that. The whole the whole concept of taking a body and pumping it full of a bunch of preservatives mm-hmm. and then putting it in a sealed container yep. that's probably in a concrete vault in the ground. Pretty much. Like, why? Why? Yeah. Yeah, pretty sure my dad's body is as well preserved as Ava Perone right now. I could go see him. 
I mean, it'd be, be a lot of digging. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'd need some specialty tools to get through the cement. I think they do pour concrete around them be, to stop grave well, robbers. They, the vault, so the concrete vault's optional, I guess. Ah. But a lot of people do it. Hmm. Um, personally, I find the whole fucking enterprise of funerals as being an immense fucking scam. Oh, absolutely. Everything is overpriced by like thousands of percents. Absolutely. And I, I and also re- it seems bad for the environment to bury some treated wood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Treated and lacquered. Uh, some A lot of them are even metal and shit. Yep. And yeah, with all kinds of polishes and other weird shit on them yeah. as well. See, I personally I'd probably go with cremation just because like, you know. Yeah, that's Cre- at least cremation, natural burial, bury me into a tree, something yeah. like that. I mean, the, my ideal funeral is I want a fucking Viking funeral. Put me on a boat that's built to be a pyre, push it out onto a lake, shoot a flaming arrow at it. That's what I want. Then I get to shoot a flaming arrow. Thank you very much. Uh, that's presuming I die first. Well, I'm being presumptuous. I'm quite healthy. <laughs> I'm all right. Let's see what the problem is. I, I might be too old to shoot a flaming arrow. <laughs> um, Have you ever shot a bow? Yeah. Not a good one, but... <laughs> anyway, uh, Dawn uh, doesn't like the idea that uh, Joyce has to be in this thing forever and she doesn't get to choose it. But my opinion, a casket's a casket. Everything else is just for show and profit, as you yeah. said. And Buffy tells the mortician, no, it's a done deal. We don't need more time because he's pulling his overly nicey nice customer service routine here that all morticians do. And I get why, but it still just kind of eats at me. It's all very fucking predatory. I not not all places are predatory. Yeah, but I have I've had dealings with some places that are I used to deliver flowers uh, briefly, regardless of whether it's predatory I feel like it's condescending, the tone that they've always got that yeah. hushed. If you need a few more minutes, then of of course we can. You can do whatever. It's just like the way Tara and Willow are talking to Dawn it later. It's very condescending. I'm like, yeah, I have notes on that. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the way. Like, I I went to three grandparents' funerals in less than a year, and they always talk like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Because I'd never really been involved on the family in meetings with the company before. Right. Until those three instances. And it's creepy. It's creepy. Anyway. So yeah. she's like, no, we don't need more time. And they fuck off. Opening sequence. Yep. And then from there we go. We're at Buffy's house where uh, Willow, Xander, Giles, Buffy, and Don are all there eating dinner. You know, we've always called it Buffy's house. But now it, like, legitimately is Buffy's house. I'm, yeah. I'm sure she inherited the deed. Yeah. Yeah. You get to pay land uh, <laughs> You get to land pay tax. mortgage. <laughs> mortgage. Well, maybe the house was paid off. We don't know. But she definitely gets to pay property taxes. Right. Or maybe. And utilities. Maybe Joyce had a big enough life insurance policy that paid the house off. Right. Or that will handle those types of annual fees yeah. for some time. Who knows? Whatever. But, yeah, basically, Buffy and Giles are talking about flowers. Don's obviously super fucking sad here, and listening in on this conversation is basically like, you know, oh, what kind of flowers? What kind of, would did mom pick the flowers? Things like that. And Buffy's kind of like shrugging her off the whole fucking time. Because, like, obviously, she's got a lot going on. Yeah, I think she's just trying to focus on what she's doing yeah. and doesn't really have time for Dawn right now, unfortunately. Uh, but Buffy actually mentions that Joyce specifically didn't want there to be any sort of wake or or anything. And Dawn gets a bit hurt that this is a conversation that Buffy had with her mom right before she went into surgery. That Dawn wasn't included on. Yeah. And I, I get being upset about that, absolutely. But I think Xander hit the nail on the head when he said that uh, I'm sure your mom just didn't want to upset you. Yeah. 
And Which, with Don was having a hell of a time dealing with that whole situation anyway. With so. the age gap, be, yeah, absolutely. And so was Buffy. And with the age gap between Don and Buffy, this all makes perfect sense. Yeah. If they were closer in age, yeah, I would totally expect her to also be included on these kinds of things. How old is Buffy supposed to be in this season? Well, uh, what's 16 plus 5, 21. Yeah, she's drinking age now. Yeah. So, you know, she's... Yeah, shit, she's six years older than seven, almost, because depending on whether Dawn's actually, like, 14, like she's supposed to be in the fucking script. Uh Uh-huh. I forget, exactly. She's 14 or 15. There's been times where, like, she's been called a 14-year-old, so I think she's canonically supposed to be 14 for this first season, so, like, that means there's seven to eight years fucking age difference? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fucking significant. It really is. It's it's entirely appropriate. But I, I get why she feels left out. She's at that awkward middle stage where she's basically an adult, but not legally an adult. And still not quite to that um, maturity level either. Right. Um, so all kinds of awkward turtle, easy to get hurt feelings. Yeah. Here we are. Um, that is the source of all of our Dawn based drama yeah buffy actually points out in this scene also that uh their dad hasn't called Mm -hmm. he's completely just fucked off he left them a number to contact him in spain yeah i'm sure they established a while back what he's off doing some sort of fucking his secretary ah some sort of business thing that's what i was thinking it was but i double checked the wiki yeah he's fucking his secretary neat I mean, I was wondering what his actual occupation is. No idea. Hmm. No, I mean, if if he's happy with his secretary, whatever. Him and Joyce were divorced, right? Mm-hmm. Ah, I don't see what the problem is. So. Yeah, divorced because he cheated on her. <laughs> gotcha. With the secretary. That's the problem. Now I see what the problem is. Okay. Frankly, it's ludicrous to have these interlocking bodies and not interlock. Putrefying disease. It'll make you blind and insane, but it won't kill you. Light a bunch of candles and have sex near them. This is how I like it. Please remove your clothing now. Cut to outside, and Xander and Willow are leaving the house. And they're talking about visiting their mothers. Specifically, Willow is going to go visit her mother because she's been doing that a lot recently. Yeah. The implication being, she's so sad about Joyce, and now yeah. she's scared about losing her own mother. Xander's like. You know, I might visit your mother more often, too. Why would I visit my own family? Those people are scary. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> but you know what? Fuck it. That's a quote of the day. <laughs> yeah. I relate. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Neato. Same for a big chunk of my family. So it's an excellent segue for... Oh, fuck the fanfare. Spike Hunters. Yeah, Spike Hunters. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to have to cut the fanfare out eventually anyway, just because he becomes such a regular on the show. Yeah, no, eh, I'll do a spikety spike again someday. Not today. It's still a little too soon. Yeah, I think we're going to get have that for the rest of this season. Probably. So uh, he brings some flowers with him, and uh, Xander, of course, tells him to fuck off. You're not going inside. Uh, fuck, 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 fuck off! off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they're I just like, want to watch someone do that to somebody, like, in person. <laughs> While, like, mimicking a chicken or something. That would be fantastic. Spike expresses that the flowers are actually for Joyce, and he actually liked her, and is a bit sad that she's gone. Yeah, Xander says something along the lines of, you expect us to believe that you actually cared about Joyce? And he says, care? Joyce was the only one of the lot of you that I could stand. Xander says, and she's the only one with a daughter you wanted to shag. I'm touched. Spike says, I liked the lady. Understand, monkey boy? She was decent. She didn't put on airs. She always had a nice cuppa for me. And, uh... (laughs) So British. How about a nice cup of tea? Anyway. (laughs) So, yeah, he insists the flowers are definitely for Joyce because he liked her as a person. He drops the flowers and fucks off in a huff after being cock-blocked by Xander. And uh, Willow picks him up and notices that he didn't leave a card. Yeah, implying that he's sincere at his his point. And uh, I believe him. Yeah. Honestly. Well, he, 
always had a fantastic rapport with Joyce. Yeah, and they they had a great number of scenes that yeah. were just Spike really Joyce good. scenes were some of the best. Yeah. I agree. Um my favorite not necessarily being uh because of his rapport with uh Joyce, but when he does the grr behind yeah. her back <laughs> and freaks out Buffy. Yeah. She's fucking one of the best moments in the entire show. It really is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're pretty sure he really just wanted to pay uh, respects for his own grieving process. Uh, but I'm sure Buffy would not have at all appreciated seeing Spike. So Xander definitely did the right thing. Yeah, I think so. And I feel a little bad for Spike, but I know I shouldn't. But hey, that's abusive relationships, am I right? Yeah. 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 Cut to the graveyard. Well, no, not yet. We get we do get a little bit of a snippet the next morning where Buffy's sitting on her bed and Dawn's sitting on her bed and they're both kind of despondent and sitting staring into the middle distance. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. And then we cut to the graveyard. The cemetery. It's a funeral montage! Ba 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 funeral, yeah! Okay, that's Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Sorry. That's. I mean, there's mortality happening here. Yeah. It, you know, the, it's close process. enough. I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you've set the wrong tone, though. So, I, I don't think so at all. <laughs> I think you're setting the wrong tone. <laughs> I'm very grateful they didn't do the fucking uh, funeral in the rain trope. Oh, right? I'm... Fuck that. Yeah, I think people got tired of that about 10 or 15 years ago. They, they're they still doing it today. Oh, yeah. So, mm-hmm. like... Also, this was made more than 10 or 15 yeah. years ago. <laughs> what are you going to do? But Buffy just has to be different every time. Well, la fucking da Good job. Well done. By the way, I was curious about this, because uh, they're, they're very obviously in a real cemetery. Sure. So I looked it up, and I couldn't find out anything specific about where this scene was shot. But I have figured out that there is specifically several cemeteries in L.A. Mm -hmm. that are set up for filming. Hmm. Real cemeteries that studios will be like, hey, book us for a day within this time frame that you don't have any other services going on. Mm -hmm. And they fucking go to a real cemetery and and shoot. That's funny. You know, because I thought it looked a lot... Okay, a lot of them look the same. It's very hard to distinguish one cemetery from another. But there's been a few where I'm, like, pretty certain that's the same-ass fucking cemetery as, like, there's the one from the beginning of A Stupid and Futile Gesture which I don't know if you've actually seen it, but uh, I I brought it up on our interview with Harry Groner. Yeah, I think I recall. And a lot of cemeteries just look like that one. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's one of those cemeteries, which is why it looks so familiar. And it makes me wonder, you're sure it's a real cemetery? Yep. I wonder if the families or even the deceased signed off on, like, yeah, I don't care if people want to film around my gravestone. Because uh, when I was filming... I think they live in L.A. Right. And I think, like, come on. Well, when I was filming Zombie Apocalypse, granted, we weren't in L.A. We were in fucking small town Vicksburg, Michigan. Yeah. And there was a cemetery right next to the abandoned paper factory where we were doing the majority of our filming. And uh, we actually got in trouble for filming in that cemetery because some of the neighbors saw it. Right. Saw us filming there. That's disrespectful. It was a bunch of fucking poorly outfitted zombies <laughs> waddling through their family's grave sites. <laughs> they, they were unhappy. Understandably. It's, it is kind of disrespectful <laughs> when you think about it. <laughs> you know, one of the key places that I go for stargazing mm. is, is it's a cemetery. Mm-hmm. Because like it's a place that's guaranteed to not have anyone else around. Middle of the night. It's super creepy, too, because it's a long uh, dirt road to get there. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so there's, like, no fucking traffic. Don't get bothered. And it's it's the darkest sky area that's within a relatively short distance of, of town. Neat. Yeah. No, I just, I like cemeteries. I find them peaceful. So after our funeral montage, uh, a lot of funerally stuff happens. 
Uh, Dawn and Tara and Willow decide it's time to leave. Buffy sticks around. We kind of uh, slowly transition to nighttime, and Buffy is the only one left. And we see a pair of legs sidle up to a Buffy pair of legs. Yes. Whose could they be? Well, spoiler alert, they're Angel's legs. Yeah. And he regrets not having been able to make it there sooner. And uh, Buffy covertly grabs and holds his hand immediately. I double checked and canonically this happens after Angel's thing with Kate and yeah. and, uh, and Darla. Yep. And at, basically he's reconnected with the rest of the team and everything. Mm-hmm. So like canonically this ha- this episode happens right after. And that the makes last perfect episode. sense. Yeah. yeah. And also that means that basically when all that stuff was happening in the episode of Angel, that's when Joyce was dead. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And everybody was in the throes of the body episode. So I guess it's a good thing that Angel managed to pull his head out of his ass in time to get that phone call. Yeah, good timing. (laughs) Cut to Willow's house. And uh, oh, by the way, also Tara lives there, but we always call it Willow's house. This is their dorm. Their dorm. I know. Willow's place. Yes. And also Tara lives there. So Dawn has her sleeping bag rolled out on the floor between Willow and Tara's bed. Willow and Tara sit on either side of Dawn doing the overly nice patronizing thing like it's actually going to make her feel better. They're like, oh, Donnie, Dawn, it'll get better. We promise. Yeah. Dawn's all like, fuck you. I don't want to forget my mom. And they're like, oh, no, that's not what we meant. Oh, no, you're going to be fine. You just keep her alive in your memories and she'll become a part of you in your heart or some shit. What bothers me here is... Why the fuck isn't Tara like, hey, look, I lost my mom. Yeah, there like, was one moment where I coming up in a moment here where Dawn's like, you don't know my pain. And I was bullshit like, shit, she does. I was like, Tara needed to respond. My fucking mom's dead, too. Yeah. Don't you fucking speak to me that way. Yeah. Because I, I, I did find it a little bit fun that uh, when Willow's like, oh, it'll get better. And Dawn's like, you don't know that. Tara says, sure she does. We're witches. We know stuff. I just thought that was cute. Oh, yeah. I lumped that in with their overly placating horse shit, but it was cute. It's, it's all very cutesy, but they decide, okay, yeah, we, we don't have to talk about this right now, Don. It's okay. Let's let's do something you want to do. We can get some sleep or we don't have to sleep. You know, we can do whatever. Play some parcheesy. And Don's like, you know what? I have an idea necromancy let's practice necromancy (laughs) let's see how that goes and because the dawnster wants to bring joyce back from the dead well let's start with my first thoughts are she's probably already been embalmed so whatever spell you cast had better involve body regeneration as well as soul retrieval and restoration yeah have you checked the services list it better be the full fucking premium package exactly do not you do not want to go discount on that kind of thing. No, you don't need a, an embalmed uh, fucking plastic puppet of your mother coming back yeah. to you. <laughs> That's torture for the soul, at least. Yeah. I'm not in your room. I'm in the hallway. The hallway doesn't belong to you. Mom, I can stand in the hallway, right? My friend Sharon's older brother knows a girl who died because she choked on her boyfriend's tongue. That'll, that'll be extra traumatizing. So cut to Xander and Anya. Fucking. No. Post fucking. Post fucking. <laughs> I I think we're, we catch them in the moment where Xander is just, one of them is just finishing. Yeah. Ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? They might've just been laying on top of each other for a while afterwards. Part of me wants to be like, why you take it to the sexy place? But the, no, the show did. They the really show did. Took it there. Yeah. Like, I could hear the sound effects of him pulling out. <laughs> like, <laughs> why did they have to have this scene at this at this point? Yeah. Uh, well, they're always like, talking about fucking. We know it's what they do when they're alone pretty much all the time. They're a couple of horny yeah. fucking rabbits. Yeah. You know, except she's scared despite, of rabbits. Yeah. Despite, not, the, despite that she doesn't like rabbits. It's not the point. Um, it probably yeah. makes it more sexy if she's scared. The The whole fucking conversation here, uh, there's a little bit of a freak, a moment where 
Anya kind of freaks Xander out because like she talks about babies and stuff. And he's like, ah, no, I don't want babies. Babies bad. How want to burn baby. But the entire point that she's saying is basically facing death and mortality makes her want to feel more alive. Yeah. And take more appreciation in, in simpler things like the joy of intimacy and sex. And the idea behind that intimacy of sex and body smooshing, as she puts yes. it, that it is intended to not only be a celebration of life, but also the idea that it is a way to create more life is exactly. very life affirming to her as it should be. So this actually made me think. And so I did a little bit of research. I just think it's funny that the bottom line here is dead Joyce made their sex better. Yes. Which is kind of her opener. Uh, but th this made me think, and I did a little bit of research, and I have discovered that there have been actual scientific studies on how grief makes people horny. Wow, I really thought you were going to say that if you inseminate a woman, that she will, in fact, get pregnant. And that is where babies come from. I mean, yes. Why would I state obvious things like that? Because that's where the joke is. I'm not the funny one. Yeah, I know. The point is, is <laughs> no, there have actually been studies on it, and grief makes people horny. Nice. Well, that's well portrayed in this scene with Xander and Anya. But there, there's also some evidence that sex can actually help you grieve faster huh? and more effectively. I knew I liked sex. <laughs> There's so much shame around sex. Yeah, it's fucking stupid. It's a bunch of horse shit. Um, speaking of sex, by the way, if you haven't yet, Josh, watched uh, <laughs> How to Build a Sex Room on Netflix, it's a fantastic fucking show. If you haven't had sex yet, Josh, <laughs> you ought to try it. I say, I say, boy, it's it's, it's quite wonderful. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> You see this it's here baseball, just my boy. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like throwing this baseball at the wall of a barn, except <laughs> it's <laughs> except it's with your penis, and there's a vagina instead of a wall of a barn, and you don't really throw it so much as, well, you'll figure it out when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, as I was saying, on on the realm of like sex being shamed, and you know, it, it's unfortunate that it is shamed. If you haven't seen the Netflix show How to Build a Sex Room, highly recommend it. It is fantastic. I will get on top of that. Giggity. Where I will fuck it <laughs> consensually. But the the host <laughs> host star of the show the the designer that like does the designing of building people's sex rooms she is this older british woman who is very forward about sex and kink and it's just i was just gonna say she's oh she's so fantastic i was gonna say oh so it's not sexy at all <laughs> not, <laughs> the Brit not the really british are the last people like, i think it's of. not it's not not sexy <laughs> but like it's it's more it's more humorous and interesting but, like, the attitude that the show has towards sex is, compared to literally everything else going on around us, a breath of goddamn fresh air. And not puritanistic. Exactly. Wunderbar, he exclaimed with great relish. Like, one of, one of the houses, or one of the uh, people that she builds a sex room for is a polycule of seven people. Splendid! And so, yeah, it's it's... Great show. Highly recommend it. Now, for the not polyamorous savvy, that doesn't mean that there's just seven people in there all having a big sloppy orgy all the time. A polycule is just a series of couples who share partners. That being said, separately, this particular polycule, this particular polycule is a group of seven people all fucking each other. Okay, so there's a term for that as well. I want to say, there, I, uh, if there is, I'm not sure. Something similar to, you know, if it's only three, then it's a threesome, or it is a group relationship. I don't know what the, no, the 
prefix for seven is? <laughs> Se- Sex is um, five, I want to say. Sep. I think sep, sep is yeah, seven. Sep. A, a sepal? Is that it? Is that a, a supple sepal? A supple. It's a okay. All right. Well, we're done. <laughs> I'm I'm done anyway. Okay. I finished. We're moving on. Uh huh. And uh, we cut to Willow and Tara's necromancy shop, <laughs> where Tara is like, "No, we can't, Don. It's wrong." And Willow's like, "Well, we we can't because it's impossible. Probably." Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I mean, I've seen some things, but it's probably not going to work. <laughs> but obviously, obviously, that's not the point. And, 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 and the point is necromancy is wrong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't do necromancy. It's wrong. If you do necromancy, you're going to have a bad time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Don's like, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> I wrote down that exact same goddamn line. <laughs> That's the third movie, <laughs> Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. There it is. We but found yeah, specifically, it. Specifically, Tara's like, well, <laughs> Wiccans took an oath not to do it, not to resurrect people. And Don's like, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> Damn right. That's what I heard. That's what Don heard. We're on the same page here. Ah, uh, yes. Cut to a graveyard. I'm sorry, cemetery. Yes. Where Angel and Buffet sit under a tree and they're talking to each other do you know what the difference between a cemetery and a graveyard is graveyard is attached to a church i don't care but i will hang on to that i will take that to my graveyard wait which one has a church graveyard oh i will take that to my cemetery where there won't be a church attached huh anyway yeah because it can't be a yard if there's no building for it to be a yard of. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just wild gravestones yep. called a cemetery. Neat. All right. That is an important distinction. I'm not sorry for judging you. For instances of this show, I would say that the other difference between a graveyard and a cemetery is graveyards probably hollowed ground. Um... If you are... If you are a vampire, better hope you don't get buried in a fucking graveyard. Mm. You're going to have a bad time. <laughs> to be clear, you mean hallowed. Yeah, that's what I... I mean, it's totally legit to pronounce it hollowed, but I think that would be more of a British pronunciation. Since oh. we're Americans, we have to say hallowed. Otherwise, how will people know that we're American and that we're well, not... I suck at pronouncing And that anyway, we're not saying so that the ground is empty. Rather, we are saying that it is... <laughs> no, our souls are. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It's because we live in the U.S. of A. Because <laughs> I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> Where but, I yeah. cry when I sing this song because it's not really true at yeah. all. <laughs> Have you noticed that when David Boreanaz and Sarah Michelle Gellar are on screen together, you can actually kind of tell how much older David Boreanaz is? Oh, absolutely. Like, I like, think about I, it every time I see him. Well, think back to season one where he's this skinny rail right. who looks like a 12 year old. But like, I don't notice it in episodes of Angel so much. Right. But anytime he's back on Buffy. Yeah. And he's back next to Sarah Michelle Gellar. It is super fucking noticeable. Because she hasn't really changed much. No. But his frame really, let's say, let itself out. I mean, he bulked. Yeah. Like he's he's still a fit dude. He yeah, just, but I'm, he even if he were, even if he got down to like five percent fat, he couldn't look like he did in season one. Exactly, his frame widened. Yeah, he's actually he got larger boned somehow. Well, you that Giggity. happens. Yeah, it's you know he wasn't twenty five yet. He he hadn't truly finished maturing. Exactly, it's a thing. So. Lots of things. Well, not not a lot of things happen, but they talk about some stuff. Um, Buffy's worried about how she's going to move on with her life now that all the structured activities associated with the death in the family are over. Yeah. It's like graduating high school a little bit, you know? You can't wait for it to be over. And then a new hell begins. <laughs> Adulthood. <laughs> exactly. And Angel assures her that she's strong and not alone and she'll figure it out. 
but she blames herself for not getting home 10 minutes earlier and falling apart on the 911 call and not starting CPR until they told her to. All completely useless things that were completely out of her control. And I think she's just feeling helpless. It's all part of the grieving process, I'm exactly. sure. Exactly. And probably... 10 times worse for a control freak like Buffy. And I get that there's some negative connotations attached to calling somebody a control freak. I wouldn't but say... But I really don't mean it in a negative way here. I wouldn't say control freak. I would say... I think the term that better fits would be... Type A personality? She's powerful. Hmm. She, she has power. Yeah. Legitimate, real fucking power. She's literally saved the world. Sure. And she and, feels powerless. Yeah, and to come across something that like you just can't do anything about. Yeah. I fuck, dude. I've I've been feeling there lately just with shitty job situations and, and things like that, where it's like I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. It gets to a point where it's like, okay, when do I admit that maybe I'm not as capable as I thought? It's not you though. Oh, and I'm aware, but you have those moments. The cards are can't... so stacked against people that aren't born into wealthy families yeah. in this country. And, you know, I, I imagine it would be kind of like how Buffy's feeling where if like... We're rapidly turning into a fascist theocracy. Yeah. And I've felt powerless about that for a long fucking time now. Yeah. It's a mind fuck. Yeah. It's a mind fuck when you, you hit that wall and there's literally nothing you can do to change anything about the circumstance mm -hmm. so you sit there and you fucking toil over the goddamn things that you should have would have could have done but it doesn't fucking matter yeah there's a great deal of myth about dragon imagine the trick to defeating him lies in separating the fact from the fiction what kind of an unholy creature that's his cheap tasteless statuary Angel offers to stay as long as she wants him to, and she blurts out the title of the episode, Forever? Forever. Forever. And then she pants like an excited dog. <laughs> Forever? <laughs> okay, no, not really. Anyway, then they make out. Angel moves back to Sunnydale. Since Kate's gone and there's no more love interest for Elle uh, in L.A. for Angel, the producers decide to cancel the show and cut their losses. <laughs> Buffy decides to become a vampire, but first she gets pregnant with Angel's baby and brings it to term. They will later turn this baby into a vampire also, just after he or she also breeds and thus... Repeating that cycle, build an eternal familial coven of vampire brood. And they'll also all have their souls re-imbued into their immortal bodies via the same gypsy curse that's holding Angel hostage. And they'll all reign supreme as the most dysfunctional, depressed, broody sociopaths ever to grace this fucking planet with its broodiness. It'll make the master look like a fucking caveman. I mean, he basically was. <laughs> Wow. Or, or, <laughs> or he can just apologize like a tool bag and cuddle her for another few minutes until he can smell the sun rising and run away from that beautiful, sexy, smexy fan fiction. <laughs> run away, run away. You know, this does bring up a question, though. Like, how come, like... Only one? Like, there's plenty of people in the know in the supernatural communities in, in the sh within the show. How come nobody thought, hey, I want to be immortal but not evil, and then essentially set up a fucking plan yeah. to be turned into a vampire and then have their soul put back in them? All you have to do is Bef chain yourself down. Exactly. Have somebody cast the spell. Boom. And now you're immortal and, and maybe, not evil. Maybe find a way Probably. to tweak it a little so that... You don't lose the soul from true happiness. That's kind of a cruel twist. Yeah. But I feel like you have to go out of your way to add to the spell, really. I think we can distill this spell down into something a little more useful. Yeah. Yeah. I, you'd want to come up with something that is not going to happen without you wanting it to happen, but something that if you need it to happen, you can have it happen. Yeah. Because, like... I wouldn't want to live forever. It's like having a cyanide pill in your tooth. Right. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to live forever. I would. I want to live a very long fucking time. Sure. But living forever sounds fucking awful. 
Um, yeah, living forever. Okay, that sounds great on paper until we think about what if you live long enough to watch the rest of the human race completely die? Which, by the way, that has been multiple instances of plot for Superman. <laughs> and then you live long enough to watch the rest of life as we know it on the planet also die. We're talking animal and plant life. And now you're just on a barren fucking rock, but you can't die. And eventually, well, you're, eventually you're you would. starving because you still need to eat, but you can't, but you're not dead. You'd eventually die, though, because eventually the sun's going to turn into a red giant and engulf the earth. But you're immortal. That won't kill you. Now you're just in a ball of fire for a few million years. But you're years. a vampire. So? Oh, well, okay. The sun. Like, if you're in the sun, I think okay, fire you're does, dead. Yeah, well, okay, I'm looking at a scenario that is in a vacuum that is minus the vampire right. death rules. Right. Obviously, there's many ways to kill a vampire, and so immor immortality is kind of a misnomer for them. Yeah. And there's just less ways for them to die and it shifts some of the dangers yeah. into other things that we don't think about like oh no that piece of wood headed <laughs> for my chest or the sunlight <laughs> fire in general they're like fire will still kill us it's no surprise it will kill a vampire right well, actually it kind of is i thought they were sturdier stock than that i mean i think the the myth is that it's purifying okay i guess anyway we're way off track. Sure. Uh, to the hospital. Yeah, that's a place. Yes, uh, where Ben works. And uh, and Jinx likes to stalk Ben there. Yeah. Often. This is usually, <laughs> if it's not Glory, he's stalking Ben at the hospital. I love that Ben's like, you're more fun when I hit you. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> uh, Ben tells him to fuck off right away, but Jinx really wants to inform him that Glory wants him to continue pursuing Buffy as a means of getting information about the key. Yes. And Ben's like, why on God's green fucking earth would I do that, you stupid piece of shit? And uh, he's like, I would never do that to an innocent. Uh-oh. Oh my, I, I seem to have uh, said too much. Uh, uh, there, uh, I need to go scrape this poop off of my shoe. Uh, really, he could have turned it around so easily by being like, I, Buffy's so innocent, I couldn't do that to her. I couldn't use her like that. And that would have been like, oh, he. I guess he was referring to Buffy as the innocent. Yeah. But he plays, He does, He. does. this man should not play poker. <laughs> His poker face I mean, was shit. I think in the end he had a good he you know he had the the flip the table method. Oh, it, yeah, his final method would have been pretty effective if he had fully followed through with it. Yeah, his follow through needs work. <laughs> his follow through needs work. But you know, he does steal Jinx's knife and stab him with it. Jinx recognizes the implications of this immediately. Yeah. That an, an innocent what? I, I oh, I excuse me. I, I need to go. I must take my leave. And, and he's, Ben's like, no, fuck you. You're just gonna the, the, the key's not a person. Jinx is like, of course, sir. Of, of course not. I would, I would never have feigned to believe such a thing. That's silly. You're just being silly now, Ben. And Ben's like, God damn it, you're just going to run back and tell her. Stab, 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 stab. Except he only stabs once. Only once. Hence the follow through. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you're going to commit murder. Murder. Follow through. Double tap, at least. You at least need a second stab if, in there. If you go to prison for attempted murder, they're just going to laugh at you. Tie him up, stick him in your trunk, let him bleed out there. <laughs> They'll just think it's some sort of, like... Um, power steering fluid or something under the car instead of blood. <laughs> that happens in a movie. I can't remember what it was. Oh, it's Josh and Sam. No, no, there was no dead bodies in Josh and Sam. Never mind. I don't even know what that movie is. Uh, it's a dumb kids movie where there's no ah. dead bodies, and I don't know why that came to mind. <laughs> but there's something where there's a dead body in a trunk, and some dude's like at a gas station, and he's there's a cop, and the cop wanders over, and he's like, "Everything okay over here? You look a little." panicked and he's like no i'm just fine and the cop sees blood dripping out of the trunk and he walks over to it and the guy's get getting ready to like pull a gun or a knife on him or on the cop or something the cop leans down and kneels down and does the two fingers to the liquid and then sniffs it and he's like 
You should get this checked out. I think you're leaking transmission fluid. Then wipes it off and leaves. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of an intense moment. Damn it, I can't remember what movie that is. Hey, if you can remember what that movie is, all you doodle-doos out there in doodle-doo land, give us a call at 269-743-0783. Because that movie would be worth a rewatch. I seem to recall enjoying it. You know, it might have been from Dusk Till Dawn. That doesn't sound right to me. Hmm. There's definitely a body in a trunk in that movie. But that doesn't really narrow it down. Yeah, I mean, come on. Bodies and trunks? That's a That's normal for movies but yeah so uh, ben absolutely can't allow jinx to fuck off back to glory and so he gives him a little gift it's called assault with a deadly weapon no he gives him his knife back <laughs> exactly is this yours jink it should be yours i pulled it out of your belt here have it back and he leans over to his ear and whispers i'm inside you okay no ben's ben's cooler than that he's not that creepy <laughs> Anyway, cut to the next day. Uh, Willow wakes Dawn up. They have to head to breakfast. Then they have to go to class. And they're going to be doing all sorts of things. And Dawn's like, oh, I don't want to go. I'm gonna just going to stay here and sleep. And Giles will pick me up. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you're sitting up and talking that coherently, you're not going back to sleep. I mean, maybe. So, my partner, Caitlin, <laughs> has, like, literally has before woken up had full conversations with me and then fell back asleep and didn't remember a goddamn bit of it. Okay, it's entirely possible then. I will concede <laughs> the point. So, regardless of that, they knowingly, they full well know that she is going to be left in a room full of spell books and even some casting ingredients. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> she was only just last night talking about doing necromancy. On her dead mom. Oh, but worse. Fucking Willow, total enabler. Jedi fucking forces a book out from the shelf. And Willow's, is like, here, look at, read this. Willow is the real villain of this episode. Yeah. There is no other villain in this episode. Not the fucking Gora but demon. Not Spike. Willow yeah. is the real problem. They are doing a great job of subtly making Willow's magic a problem. Yeah. In the previous scene, when she was talking about the resurrection spell, her entire attitude was about, like, it's very, it's nearly impossible. It's very hard. You probably can't do it. It's very interesting, though, and maybe we might want to look into it. Yeah, it's borderline sociopathic, really. Yeah. She's like, she cares more about, can she, and doesn't stop to think about, should she? Yeah. She's, uh... I want to say she's Jeff Goldblooming it, but she's the opposite and of Jeff Goldblooming it. She's the people Jeff Goldblum was talking about. This particular moment, though, really bothers me because it's like, if you think resurrection would be difficult for you, Willow, <laughs> and now you're handing the keys to this this endeavor to a fucking 14-year-old. Well, because... Grieving 14-year-old, mind you. Yeah, but Dawn hasn't taken the, the Wiccan vows, so she's got a little bit of a skirt around the issue, the morality issue there yeah. a little bit, not nearly enough to justify any of this. Right. Cause Willow apparently just has no integrity or respect for the dark arts and their relationship to the fabric of reality and the natural order in this moment. Yeah. And so they leave and immediately Don finds this book entitled the history of the, the history of magic. No, the history Bynum's history of witchcraft. Okay. Yeah. Apparently it will show up in other instances in the series. Neat. Yeah. Uh, so she flips through it and goes very quickly straight to the section on resurrection and gets a thoughtful look on her face. Yeah. Feel free to tell me if this next part gets a little too personal because I'm told I have a drop of green. Years. But I'm a part. I am great. I am beautiful. I am lucky to you. All eyes turn to me because my name is a holy name. And you won't listen. And then and we cut to the magic box. Da magic da, box. Magic box. That's the one. Yeah. That's ex yeah. It's later in the day, I'm, I'm and glad Dawn you is specified. Yes. I wasn't sure which one. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a strip mall. There's like four. Right, because the well, the other one's called the magic box, and then there's another one that's called the magic box. 
So specifically, we needed <laughs> the magic, magic box. box. See, it's yeah. very important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a proper distinction. Oh, anyway, this is later in the day. Dawn is dusting and claiming that being useful keeps her mind off things. But I think she's lying. What? Yeah. No. I do like the whole time during the scene, Anya's like super threatened about her job because like Dawn is free labor. <laughs> that is an excellent gag throughout this scene. And I completely believe it coming from Anya. Oh, God, yeah. And it also helps move this scene forward. It's geniusly written yeah well it's very very cleverly written sure why not genius so giles the fucking saint that he is tries to tell dawn that she doesn't have to clean you don't have to do that stop dusting sit down grieve your dead mother and even anya suggests in her own crude way that she should be you know playing with some chicken's feet or watching tv don't children enjoy less effort and more cartoons cartoons yeah, yeah. I, I love the way she worded it and uh, you know something non-laborious but dawn insists that being useful keeps her mind off of things so giles of course immediately declares then useful you shall be and dawn plays him expertly like a fiddle she could win a goddamn contest with yeah. the devil right now with just a few questions she gets all the information she needs about this place and where to find everything she needs doesn't take much no not at all and as you said anya gets hilariously uncomfortable about <laughs> dawn stepping all over her toes like she also gets to fondle the money she got a turk a jab <laughs> sorry that's a south park reference you're gonna take my jab quote of the day she says uh but of course it's wonderful that you find doing my job so distracting <laughs> i am unthreatened proceed <laughs> so so anya yeah and so don cleverly inquires whether there's anything off limits for her to clean like you know <laughs> there wouldn't be any super powerful books or something that i should avoid <laughs> cleaning uh should i you know if anyone should ask for resurrection books where should i definitely not direct them to yeah you know get a lot <laughs> of people asking about resurrection we can't have that I'm I'm looking out for you, Giles. I got this. Can can you maybe even show me the section in the book that specifically says resurrection <laughs> so I know what to look for? Yeah, I, I need to know where to steer people away from specifically. <laughs> and Giles just takes the bait hook, line, and sinker. And he's like, oh, uh, look over yonder and uh, see, see that loft up there. If anybody asks about that, uh, just come get me first. And uh, he even offers to teach her about the register and uh, doing transactions. Again, killing Anya to get very jealous yeah. that uh, Dawn gets to fondle the money, as you said. Yes. And uh, Giles then takes this moment to deliver a box to the back room or somewhere else. Yeah, something like that. And a customer comes in. And I just have to mention this. You know, you fucking know that the entirety of the witchy community knows and talks about Anya. <laughs> Anybody who goes into that store interacts with her, mm -hmm. and she's just so fucking over the top. Oh, that woman. Yeah. yeah. Everyone has that has a story that they talk about Anya. Everyone has it. I wish we got to hear more of what she was saying to this customer, because now she's in this totally revved up mind state yeah. where she's worried about <laughs> losing her job for no good reason exactly. to a 14 year old <laughs> uh, that she shouldn't be th feel threatened about at all. And well, she <laughs> she's worried that Giles is turning out to be a capitalist and, and you know, <laughs> would sell off her job for, you know, free child labor. For cheaper labor. That's, yeah. I mean, she is old timing. She's a couple hundred. She's like a thousand years old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's actually the oldest one in this in this show. That's true. Is she older than the master, though? Hmm. I don't think so. I'm not sure how old the master is. I'm sure we could figure that out with a quick Google search. I'm going to look that up. You look that up. So, yeah, I just thought it was funny how Anya runs off to them to prove her worth with overzealousness. And I can just imagine it going so poorly. She's just going to drive this customer away. Oh, right. Yeah. And Dawn seizes the moment like a fucking champ. She runs up the ladder and picks up a book and a potion bottle or whatever it was. It seems a bit quick how she's able to find oh, it so God. quickly. She, like 
way too fast. Like, she must be a really fast reader or something. Yeah. I don't know. They need to keep the story moving. It's fine. So she sticks them in her backpack and she clips it shut. And as she's climbing down the ladder, Giles re-enters the room. She hears the hippie doorway beads rattle behind her. And like a true stealth game, she just stops moving. Don correctly presumes that Giles is a T-Rex. And if she doesn't move, he can't see her. And she slowly makes her way to the floor, and Giles hears her very last footstep onto the floor, just as she's at ground level again. And he turns to her, suspecting nothing. Yeah. And is like, oh, come over to the register and observe Anya doing a transaction. If you'd like to learn how to do the register. I'm Giles. I say things. (laughs) (laughs) I'm British, you see. And she's like, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. And we're left with this ominous shot of her backpack laying at the foot of the ladder. Yeah. What were you um, looking up again? So the master... Um, oh, how old is the master? Yeah. Doesn't say specifically, but he was turned by a descendant of the demon lord who created all vampires, I guess. Okay. But he is at least as old as at least the 12th century. Mm. Anya could be older. So Anya... I'm fairly certain they established that she's at least a thousand years old. She was born in 860. Ooh. I think she actually is older than the master. Nice. That's funny. Yeah. Cool. She's the oldest character we... Well, no, because Glory, but... Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Glory she's... is literally a god, so... But out of the regular characters, she's definitely the oldest. Crazy. It makes sense that she's the most out of touch. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, yeah. So we cut to a night. We cut to a graveyard, or I'm sorry, cemetery at nighttime. Yes. Specifically Joyce's grave. Yep. Dawn is there gathering some grave dirt. Grave dirt. Uh, then Spike arrives, sees what she's doing. Spike! Kitty Spike, Kitty Spike, Kitty Spike, Kitty Spike, Spike! I like that he points out that it's like, you better hope that that... Uh, spell doesn't require anything more than dirt. Otherwise, you're into zombie territory. And that's just a bad time. You're going to have a bad time. (laughs) And that's just not neat. (laughs) I hope it's dirt you're after. If the spell calls for anything more than that, you're into zombie territory. And that's bad news. Little bit. He doesn't say a little bit. I like it when he does, though. Yeah. Kind of funny. So she tries to deny what she's doing, but Spike cuts her off immediately yeah the book that she has is infamous he's like i know exactly what you're up to don's like no don't tell buffy i'm not gonna tell a little bit i'm gonna help yeah cut to giles's house oh man this is a good good scene it's a solid moment you know what he's listening to right tales of brave ulysses by cream do you know what that means what the like significance of that is right yeah it's the song he listened to with joyce during band candy yeah mm-hmm. it's fucking good as he wistfully sips some whiskey remembering joyce yeah i teared up a bit when i read that on the it just said that in my transcription oh did it yep so that yeah. saved me some research and then i listened to the whole song on youtube it's a good just, song just to really get into the moment it's a good song it is it's very 60s Oh, well, and yeah. I just really like 60s music. Yeah. So even better. I mean, I I enjoy the I enjoy a lot of uh British rock from the, that age. Oh, was it British? Yep. I didn't even realize that. Yep. Nice. So yeah, that's what he does. That's that's what happened there. Cut to out on the street at night. Yep. Spike. Where Spike is walking with Don to you know, go get shit for the spell. And Don calls him out for being shitty and stalking Buffy and basically accuses him of only helping her because she he's trying to get in with Buffy. Um, and uh, yeah, he makes it abundantly clear that that's bullshit. Buffy is never to know about this. Don wants to know why the fuck he's doing it then if he doesn't want credit. And this is a, a great add-on to... This, the flower scene with him and Willow. Yeah. It's partially he wants to see uh, Buffy and Dawn happy again. Uh, his line is, I'll just don't like to see Summer's women take it so hard on the chin is all. Which, that's a lie. He wants Joyce back. 
for his own selfish oh, I, reasons. I he really liked Joyce. I think he is also like doing a little bit of protection of like he he likes Don. Yeah. It makes um, me sad that she doesn't like him now because he's not a danger to her. He's a big brother to her. Yeah. He's not creepy to her, but he is very creepy to and problematic to Buffy. Yeah. And that's that really makes me sad that that destroys such a fun relationship that he had for at least one episode with Don. And if they just didn't take certain things with him and Buffy in the direction they did, they could have... They could have held on to that. Yeah. Could have had a big brother, little sister dynamic. Yeah. And made it less problematic. But whatever. The, the whole point of Spike was to make him problematic because of Joss Whedon's... What's the word? I, let's stick with calling it the showrunner. I'm tired of saying that fucker's name. All right. I mean, he's not Voldemort. I uh, know, but... I, <laughs> that's like saying that we have to say he who must not be named. I don't know. I just... I prefer calling it him and his ilk the showrunners or something along those lines but just all cause... i was trying to reference was um we're getting this really problematic character because of his perverted idea of what a healthy relationship is right and spike didn't have to be quite this problematic and he still could have been a fun villain and a great addition to the scooby gang eventually yeah but there... that's not what we got and that's why kind of why we're doing this podcast Love this guy wants to fight with weapons. I've got it covered from A to Z. From axe to Z other axe. I'm fairly certain I said no interruptions. Cut to Glory's lair. Yes. Where Glory's upset about Jinx missing. Hey, he's dying. (laughs) (laughs) Poor baby. (laughs) I think Glory's mansion or whatever the fuck, we should just call it a lair because... She's evil. Yeah. Everything else is a lair when it's some gross demon or a vampire or whatever. But then we get this human passing pretty white blonde and suddenly where she lives is a house or an apartment or a mansion. Fuck that. She's evil. It's a lair. I think it should be a lair. Yeah. I'm going to start making the distinction for people I don't like in real life. I'm going to call their (laughs) house a lair. (laughs) So Jinx comes into Glory's lair, <laughs> being, you know, not really carried, but assisted by yeah. two other him demons. His, Jinx his does... His folk, if you will. Jinx does uh, a piss poor job of toting to, to Glory as he reveals to her that, you know, the key is a person. And he probably bled on the carpet right after she told him not to. Oh, of course. He is such a shitty toady. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I bet you there is blood all over that chair. All over. Oh, the couch ruined. We're done with that couch. Yeah. Do you know how expensive those things are? Not very, but it's so inconvenient. (laughs) I don't know. This is in (laughs) Glory's mansion. It's probably a fairly expensive piece of furniture. Well, I don't know. It didn't uh, look particularly comfortable, and usually expensive pieces of furniture are particularly uncomfortable. But as you were saying, he miserably fails to worship her with any amount of real eloquence. Yeah. He's like, he's talking about Ben and uh, telling him what the key is. And he says, he indicated that it was a person most highest you. <laughs> and Glory is severely excited by this. The keys in human form? Oh my God. I, I believe so. Good one. So after ripping her hair out from true instability and craziness. Yeah. Glory turns to him and fawns all over him in her own gross way, forgiving him for his lame toadiness. And then when he loses consciousness from blood loss, beckons that they fix him (laughs) so that she can hear his story again without, without all of the annoying moaning, you know, because psychopath. Exactly. No empathy. Isn't that funny? Ugh so funny i mean it is lack of empathy it it is in the way that they present it absolutely (laughs) ah she has no hey they're demons they're not people right so it works (laughs) glad we had this conversation she's evil everyone here is evil everyone's evil (laughs) you get a stab wound you get a stab (laughs) wound everyone gets a stab wound except glory 
Cut to old stinky man house. Yes, old stinky man house where Spike and Dawn enter. Apparently, he's not human because Spike just walks right in. Oh, good point. Well, yeah. We do notice that he is not human. Yeah. Yeah. We get hints that he's not human, but mm-hmm. like the moment Spike just walked in there, I'm like, okay, is that his business or his house? And it, once it showed the place and it's like, okay, that's his house, then he's not human. But also it's entirely plausible he's been invited in before because this is a contact that he knows about and sounds to have known, known about for some time. I don't know. I got the tone of him talking about it and everything. It didn't seem like he knew the guy. kind of sounded like he had never met the guy, but it was vague enough that it's possible that he had been there before. I, I suppose. All I'm saying. But it's more likely that it's just because he's a demon and he doesn't need an invitation. Yeah. So Don says, wow, this doesn't smell like a spellcaster house. It smells like a 60-year-old man house. And I'm like... I don't see how those two are mutually exclusive. Right? Like, I would imagine that, like, some old wizard's house would probably smell a lot like what my grandparents' house smelled like. Yeah. Mothballs and... Just, you know, a little bit more old book. Pipe smoke. Old books. Mold. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Ben gay. (laughs) Except (laughs) Ben's not gay. He's totally into Buffy. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. So enter the spindly, short, nerdy wisp of a man in his house robe. Who mistakes Spike for someone else. Yeah, he thinks Spike is this guy from the corner who likes to play dominoes. At least I assume that's what he meant by dominoes. Yes. Although his hair is different. It's a different color and he's a vampire. And the look that Don and Spike give him, uh, he responds with, just because the lights are dim doesn't mean the juice is all gone. <laughs> Man, that, that metaphor is all over the place. It is. And that's why I like it. <laughs> What's the term? Um, Malfor? Or yeah. something like that? I, I like them. I yeah. Like them. He's a couple picnics short of a shed. Yes. His shed is a few sandwiches short of a light bulb. Yes. He's not the sharpest crayon in the refrigerator. Are you done? Mm, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, they ask him about resurrection spell. He's like, oh, you probably don't actually want to resurrect anybody. How about a tonic to like, make the grief go by super fast? Get super, super grieving. Fuck that. Ain't need no tonics. Give me your resurrection spells. Mm. Nope. She is on a mission. She wants that resurrection spell and she does not care that he might also have a tail. And she didn't even have to say all that. He just kind of was like, ah, you're not leaving till you get a resurrection spell. Well, I warned ye. So he snatches a hair off her head and then it's like, ooh, good DNA. Like, oh, you don't want to do that. Moment of silence. Ah, but they really want to do that, so I guess I'm going to assist them in doing that, because that sounds fun. Yoink, got your hair. Got your hair. Good DNA. Starts humming. I recognized what he was humming, but I don't know the title of it. And he grabs a couple of books and a notepad, and he comes back, and he's like, okay. Uh, I I love that he was, like, looking at all the, like, a bunch of books, like, on the mantle and everything. Yeah. And then he turns around, and the book he picks up is, like, the size of a fucking coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, he was looking at all the books on the mantle, like looking for this particular book. And it's like, I think if I had a book in my collection that was that goddamn big, I would remember the fucking name of it. And I would think not so much, oh, I need to find the book that has this title. But I would think, oh, I'm looking for this book. It's the one that's the size of a coffee table. Also, if he's the guy who knows everything there is to know about resurrection on the Hellmouth. Right. He doesn't need the book, especially considering how simple the spell turns out to be. Yeah. Um, it is very simple. So, you know, For but being al- something so difficult seems quite simple to me. But also, I really hate it when people nitpick my thought process while I'm just internally processing something and they don't understand why I go to one place, like look inside the fridge, go to the bathroom come back look at something on the internet i don't know etc yada it all seems out of order and like it has no bearing on what's specifically what they're trying to get an answer to or figure out and i'm like why don't you just let me work my magic 
That makes some sense, because I Because I'm neurodivergent as fuck. And you're gonna just need to hold on to your fucking shit panties, okay? Alrighty. And I he's clearly neurodivergent. Yeah. But yeah. also very knowledgeable in this subject. So he comes back to the table with this book, which he probably knew he was gonna grab all along. Right. But just needed to stare at his other books to help him think. Uh, we notice that he's got a tail flicking out the bottom of his robe, and oh no, he's a demon. All right, that's neat. He tells her they, they'll need an egg of a Gora demon, but they won't be able to buy it. It's not like making an omelet. You gotta steal it, right? From their fucking nest. And hey, luckily they like to nest near the Hellmouth. Yeah, it's better if you rip it straight from their quivering moist cloaca. That's your best option right there. Talk about Meyer Fresh, am I right? So here I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna break it down step by step. Step one: <laughs> first, you must gain the demon's trust and bed them. Step two: you must fist the demon so as not to arouse suspicion <laughs> as to your intent. Step three: omelet. This completes the steps. Is step four <laughs> profit? <laughs> There's no profit. Oh, okay. <laughs> you cry yourself to sleep. After I mean, a, those are giant eggs. Though. After you a very a lot of omelets. After a very big omelet, just one, but it's gonna be so fresh. <laughs> and I've always, I've always wanted to get my hands on a <laughs> on an ostrich egg. Yeah, to make an omelet because like one ostrich egg, you could make like three omelets. You could feed a family <laughs> of five, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Spike specifically asks where to find the Gora demons, and this old fuck just <laughs> steamrolls right over the question. Uh, he's like, well, first, you need a picture of Joyce, or the person, whatever, and to make a sacred circle with all the ingredients inside of it, uh, he hands Don a piece of paper with an incantation written on it, and he's yep. like, say it three times and she'll come to you. She's not just going to blip into existence in front of you. Um, m- mainly meaning, yeah, she's going to have to claw her way out of her fucking yeah. grave. It'll take some time. Hope you didn't go for the concrete option. <laughs> <laughs> if anything goes wrong, the only way to fix it is to destroy the picture. Yeah, fair warning. <laughs> if anything goes wrong, things mm-hmm. can get a little off. It's kind of a touchy spell. And Dawn's like, but she'll still be my mother, right? Yeah, oh, more or less. <laughs> I like his whole tone is when he's like, if things go wrong, he's not saying if things go wrong. He's saying when, when you discover that everything is wrong. Like I tried <laughs> to tell you at the very beginning of this conversation, but you just wouldn't listen. The moment you've realized you have fucked up, <laughs> tear up that photo. Just call me the doctor of fucking things up. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. I'm going to enjoy this. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so we leave with his truly confidence-inspiring words, more or less. And Spike asks again about where to find the Gord Demons. He's like, oh, in the sewer entrance near Tracy Street. Opening's on the left, you can't miss it. Yeah, it gives fucking directions like to the fucking convenience store down the road. And Spike, the sewer rat that he is, probably knows exactly the one he's talking about. Oh, yeah. Even though I'm like, wow, those are vague-ass directions. He's probably like, oh, right, it's the tunnel that has the brick above it that's a little off-center. Ah, yes, that one. So Don tries to pay <laughs> him with this wad of cash. Yeah. He kindly says with a sweet smile, oh, keep your money, child. Only you must keep in touch with me and let me know how it goes. And then it <laughs> gets fucking creepy. I want to hear the really cool story of how you fucked this up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it seemed like... They were doing a handshake thing, and he, like, started to squeeze really hard. Well, his eyes turned black. And then his eyes flicked black, and he growls a little. Uh, It was very... It was exactly like any demon from Supernatural. Their eyes are always black. When they want them to be. So anyway, they fuck off. Yeah. Well, Dawn, Dawn's definitely weirded out by that fucking response. Oh, yeah. But... She's, she's slightly less grateful all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit. Once upon a time, there was um, a kitty. She was very little, and she was all alone, and nobody wanted her. Did the kitty get chosen by some nice people? Well, now you ruined the ending. Cut to the sewer. Yeah, so I really like them as a team. 
Oh yeah, they're fun. They're fun. Because Spike's basically a 14-year-old girl at heart. I, you know, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, so basically, Spike's like, oh, I'm going to go in there and get the egg. And Don's like, oh, no, I, you need to distract the demon and I'll get the egg. And Spike like tries to argue and Don's like, nope, bye, I'm walking in. Yeah, she leaves. <laughs> Better come in and save me. <laughs> she leaves absolutely no room for further discussion on the matter, leaving Spike saying, well, what do you know? Biddy Buffy. Yeah. <laughs> Cut, hey, she, just like I, I give Dawn a lot of credit. She's got guts. Oh, yeah. She puts her mind to something. Nothing can stop her. Not even a vampire with a chip in his brain that specifically stops him from violence. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess that's not the best thing to rely on in this situation. <laughs> anyway, so they find this big dragony lizardy thing sleeping. It's not that big, but it's it's kind of big. Like it's, I mean, it's it's bigger than my car. I, it's yeah. It's I was gonna say it's bigger than a large dog. I wouldn't want to fuck with that. <laughs> I'd say it's probably bigger than a bear, even probably about the size of a rhinoceros or a, a yeah. hippo. Not a hippo. Hippos are way bigger than you think. Somewhere between a rhinoceros and a hippo. I would I would say hi- rhinoceros wouldn't be bad. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, also. Surprise! It has three heads. What? Yeah, because Spike runs at it with an axe and he says, Heads up! And it rears up, snarling, revealing it has three heads. Yeah. Spike quips, Right. Heads it is. Ha! A plural. What a gag. Oh, jeez. So he swings and he nicks at it a few times while Don nicks the egg. See what I did there? Yeah, I did. Ah. Very well done. I know. And they run. <laughs> Spike leaves the axe in one of its necks. And as soon as they reach the tunnel on their way out, Don drops and breaks the fucking egg. God damn it. I mean, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break an egg. Oh, yeah, yeah. but that's but a bad they, place. They to... need the whole egg. They should really find a stove first. Yeah. Oh, well. So we see the yolk and the white spill across the cave floor. Spike tells her to leave it and keep running. He's, he gives up so easily. Right. But she won't have none of that. She nope. runs straight back to the nest and is immediately backed against a wall by three snapping, snarling, toothy faces of the Gora demon. But Spike swoops in to save the day, grabs the axe. Oh, I, well, first he throws some rocks at it. Then he gets the axe and then he hacks the other side and leaves the axe in the other side of the thing's neck. He does, in fact. Uh, and then Don gets the egg and they skedaddle. I really appreciated that we saw his reluctance in his face, but also he didn't hesitate. Right. Uh, he's like, not helping her is not an option. Yeah. Which we've seen plenty of instances where not helping was the first thing on his mind. Yes. And <laughs> actually helping them later, even Buffy, was an afterthought. Yeah. So that really speaks to him actually starting to care, or at least truly understanding the consequences right of dawn not getting out of this alive or unharmed well and if dawn doesn't get out alive no one's bringing joyce back from the dead <laughs> also that yeah i think he would probably just skip town if dawn died yeah. <laughs> especially if not just if dawn died but if dawn died and was last seen with spike <laughs> he's fucked oh yeah he is he is done she'll They're... fucking hunt him down to her last day to her last hour i don't even think i think the only way he's gonna survive at that point is leave this plane of existence <laughs> right like he's got a dimension hop she at will that point. chase him into hell <laughs> to fuck him up yeah <laughs> so yeah she gets a second egg and uh looks that thing right in the fucking face and then spike takes care of it he even did he get his axe back or he left no, it in he, the neck he, again? He left, he left it there. Okay, yeah. They narrowly escape with the egg. Dawn apologizes for causing Spike to get mauled a bit, and he, he replies, he "Got a little chew done, a, just a little, a little bit. bit." I think he liked it. I think he's <laughs> going to come back to this thing and keep it as a pet later. <laughs> but Spike replies, "Did you get it?" And she holds up the egg, and he says, "Then don't be sorry." And Damn it, I wish Spike didn't make me like him so much when he's not being a huge piece of shit. Yeah. You know? Because that was really fucking cool. I definitely go back and forth on him. Right. A lot. Yeah. Because one moment he's super fucking charming and, like, he's really fucking cool. 
And then the next moment, you're like, God damn it, why are you a fucking evil fucking asshole? Seriously, though. But we cut to Dawn's room, and boy, did things escalate quickly. She's yeah. already made... She doesn't waste any fucking time. She's got the sacred circle, and she's reciting the incantation to Osiris. Yep. And then we cut away back to Willow and Tara's, where Willow explains that she's begun keeping a journal. Because, you know, life happens so fast. Makes sense. It's another re- grief response, you know. Definitely. And if you don't um, write it down, it tends to have a way of just kind of disappearing. Yeah. This is when Tara notices that history of witchcraft is missing. Oh, no. But doesn't notice how extremely fucking guilty Willow is. Oh, I think she noticed. Mm. I think she just chose not to tackle that particular issue at this very moment. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Willow reacts super fucking suspiciously, and ultimately they decide they don't have time even to look to see if Dawn took anything besides the book, right. and they need to call Buffy right meow yep. and make sure Dawn's not up to anything stupid. And then we cut back to Buffy's house, where Buffy just returns home to the phone ringing, answers it. We assume it's Willow and Tara, though we don't know that for certain. Must be. Uh, we cut to upstairs where Dawn's just finishing up the spell and Buffy walks in on it. Just as she's finishing the final incantation and we hear a clap of thunder. Yep. Buffy's all, what are you doing? What have you done? No. <laughs> you want zombies? This is how we get zombies. That's how you get zombies. <laughs> and Dawn's like, she's coming home, Buffy. And they go downstairs and they're having a big argument right in front of the front door and bleeding into the living room. Buffy yells that she's got... Dawn has no idea what kind of shit she's messing with. Tara mentioned that these things go wrong all the time. These And she has no idea what she's actually raised. Uh, Dawn protests briefly that the guy said she had good DNA. Almost <laughs> completely revealing how she learned how to do this. Right. Buffy's like, wait, who fucking helped you? Yeah. Glosses over that. Yeah. And it's like, you need to, you know what? I don't care. You need to reverse this immediately. Dawn starts accusing Buffy of pushing her away. Real quick, cut to Joyce's zombie legs in the graveyard. Right, right. I forgot about that. And then back Uh, to the living room. Yeah. So Dawn accuses Buffy of pushing her away, cutting her out, not wanting her there, um, not caring about her mom's death, to which Buffy fucking slaps her. Yeah, it was a bit intense. Yeah. A bit intense. Basically, this leads into Buffy start, like cracking at the seams and breaking down. Specifically, Dawn uh, doesn't even imply. She straight up says, you've been stomping around doing all these chores like you're cleaning up after Joyce's mess. Yeah. Not verbatim, but that's really uh. close to what she says. And Buffy's only response to that is to slap her really hard and you know and i get why like that's not what you ought to do but i totally fucking understand that response i understand the response and i really wish she had immediately shown regret and apologized yeah but she didn't they kept arguing i mean she obviously didn't slap dawn very hard because you know it didn't snap her neck (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it didn't draw blood. Yeah. Um, and she was still standing. <laughs> right. So she, she, that is clear evidence that she pulled the slap. Yeah. From her but, slayer strength. But basically, Buffy goes on to say how essentially she needs to keep moving because she can't, if she stops doing anything, then it becomes real. And then she's really gone. Yeah. Which is a point you'd think Don would understand, considering she right. used this exact argument as a lie to fool Giles earlier into telling her where the good spell books are. Exactly. And Buffy continues explaining very tearfully, I think actually kind of crying at this point, that she's scared. She doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't know who's going to make everything better and who's going to take care of them if she doesn't. And then uh, just slightly behind Dawn and Buffy, out the the picture window covered by drapes, we see this vaguely joist-shaped silhouette passes in front of the window. I wonder if they actually used 
like if if she came back to do that or they like i wondered the same somehow. thing and i didn't bother to look it up i tried looking it up and i couldn't find an answer oh lame is she credited in the episode no then probably not yeah. i do vaguely recall hearing that they did not actually bring her back and if you look at the silhouette it doesn't really look a thing like joyce right except it looks like they put a man in a wig and said walk in front of this light in front of these curtains that's what it looked like but yeah uh shortly after the uh shadow across the window there's a knock on the door and buffy go oh man the moment when buffy turns around looks at the door and goes mommy something about buffy saying mommy jesus cuts straight to the fucking aorta man uh but she runs over to the door to open it and dawn tears the photo in half in just before Buffy opens the door. Yeah. And nothing out there. I think it's interesting that it just made the zombie Joyce, uh, disintegrate and just apparate back into where I back into her grave or what? I I don't know. No, I, I have very interesting thoughts about this moment because if you do say so, I find it interesting because, so the moment when Dawn realizes that Buffy is as much, if not more, of a mess than she is, mm-hmm. that's when she's like, oh, fuck, what have I done? I need to undo this. I, I think when she turned around and went, mommy, must have been the moment where Dawn said she doesn't want to risk Buffy being more traumatized by seeing yeah. a fucked up version of her dead mom. Yeah, because honestly, all the evidence is pointing to that's probably the case. Oh, God. Yeah. I like and and she knows it and she just doesn't care up to this point because she thinks that even some distorted version shadow husk of her once mother is better than nothing because she thinks she has nothing. Yeah. And I think she just in this moment realizes she really does have Buffy and after Buffy And opened. she acts quickly, as we see many times yeah. in this episode. She seizes moments fearlessly and takes action. Um, and after Buffy opens the door and nothing is there, they grab each other and break down, and that's it. That's that's the end of the episode. Gerarg. Gerarg. Is this for me? I must be ready. I need my strength, strength. Give, give, give me more! Nights, I shall walk in Hold on. You've got something here. Huh? How'd you feel about this episode, Rex? I really fucking liked it, actually. One of the main things I liked is it was completely Dawn-centric, mm-hmm. but in a way that we haven't had before, where, like... In the past, all the Dawn-centric episodes have been more about how Buffy's reacting to Dawn more than anything. Mm-hmm. But Buffy was barely even fucking in this episode. That, yeah, that was more of a background element. We still had some of that because there's still this problematic theme thread of uh, Dawn feeling ignored and yeah. essentially neglected. Um, and I'm like, damn shit, I thought we got past this. Oh, we got lots more time with that till I know. And well into next season. And the problem is, Dawn's not entirely wrong. No, she's not. Buffy wasn't taking the time to tend to Dawn, even though that's one of her prime concerns is who's going to take care of Dawn. Yeah. Even though she'd already taken on the vast majority of the mantle of taking care of Dawn. And you're already fucking that up. But it's... I'm not blaming her for that. It's understandable. But this is just a thing that keeps happening. I think what this episode really shows, like expertly shows, is how Dawn is a child and does not understand the depth of what's going on with Buffy. Sure. Um, Just sees the surface and doesn't dig further. Yeah. It's a really good showcase of how children and adolescents and well into the teens fail to understand the depth of other people. They don't they can't see other people in a complex manner. Mm-hmm. And so when you get situations like this, they can only fucking see the surface 
and it's everything they see is so filtered through you know what essentially is a very self-centered worldview yeah which you know any immature individual child adolescent whatever is going to have a very self-centered worldview because they just don't they don't understand how to have a wider worldview Mm -hmm. and this this episode shows dawn's struggle with that perfectly and i think grief as being a channel of showing that is i think exactly what you need because i think most of us if we had big grief around that time in our life that's how we kind of opened up to the idea and like our worldview changed drastically because of that grief and so i think the way this is written for this character is just so impressively spot on took the words right out of my mouth both for don and for buffy and the way that they play off of each other is geniusly written i bandied the word about earlier in the episode and uh, i it's all genius uh because once once you find yourself getting lost in uh, whether or not to blame a character for their actions or not that's a point that you've reached where you realize this is written really well it's immersive yes. it's got me yes. immersed um and i'm not even thinking about the quality of the writing which speaks to the quality of the writing. Right, right. Um, the other thing that I think is really clever about this episode is how naturally it flowed from last episode. I think what we're going to see subtly throughout the next uh, few episodes are the stages of grief. And this one is very ser- very clearly, I couldn't stop thinking it the whole episode, denial. Yep. This is a very uh, denial and bargaining episode very much so um dawn is trying to uh, definitely much more denial than it is bargaining but a little bit of bargaining she's like well if i do this then i can get don i can get mom back i also really appreciate the idea here that well hold on and even buffy is still in denial oh because she's still using work and chores and preparations for the funeral as an escape um, so that she can, I don't know if you could say dissociate, but at the very least she's avoiding her emotions. Right. I mean, for fuck's sake, which is a form of denial. When angel showed up, she, that was just, you know, part of that. It was escapism. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have any relationship with angel where that's a level of comfort. And at least that's that's escapism. Yeah. And because last we saw them, they had a big fucking falling out and a big fucking fight because they had to really face some of the problematic aspects of their relationship. Exactly. To which we mostly agreed that Angel was on the right side of and she needed to cut him some fucking slack because she was blaming him a little too much for things that are out of his control. Right. That's exactly what some people do is they wrap up in so many things that they, they don't have time... Like, grieving is a second thought at best. And at least she had the wherewithal to tell Angel, no, this is a bad idea. You should probably yeah. go. Um, because she, she still could... kissed him, though. And then they're like, oh, oh, God. No, this is a really bad idea. Oh, he kissed back. Oh, yeah. He kissed back. You know, I'm, it's... I'm sorry, but if Sarah Michelle Gellar kissed me, I would kiss back. Oh, right. Like, <laughs> she's an amazing person. I mean, I would. I would not be able to resist that they've both been through so much (laughs) shit they deserved a nice moment yeah but they both knew that it was fantasy and it couldn't last oh the the look on david boreanis's face though was so well done after their kiss he portrays oh this felt too good (laughs) (laughs) oh shit this is not a good road or i mean it is a good road and that's the problem yeah (laughs) Yeah. where we're right on the edge of angelus territory why don't i go blue skies on the oh god no (laughs) (laughs) no prudy prudy i'm sad I'm sad. I'm blowing it <laughs> from across the sea. <laughs> so. uh, do you have a quote of the day? I, this, the quote of the day for this episode was hard. 
Uh, I'm going to go with an Anya line from the scene where they're in the magic box. And she says, but of course, it's wonderful that you find doing my job so distracting. <laughs> I am unthreatened. Proceed. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe her. I don't believe her at all. <laughs> um, I'm going to cheat for my answer. No, don't do that. I We have hard and fast rules here on Beer with Buffy. My hard air quotes quote of the day is actually not going to be spoken line at all. It's just going to be the scene of Giles listening to that record. Oh, I'll it's allow it. It's too brilliant, subtle writing. Mm. Because you have to know the show to know what's, what, what you're seeing there. Yeah. I'm the sort of person that my emotions are highly compartmentalized. So generally speaking, when it comes to things like grief, logic is a big part of it. And I don't really experience grief in a, a bombastic way. It doesn't really take over on me or anything like that. And I tend to respond the way we seem to see Giles responding, where, you know, he takes care of business as needed. He's there for the people around him. And then he grieves in his quiet moments when you know it's a a safe space to do it and that just speaks to me on a very deep deep level it's such a a well-written moment and it could have easily been missed if you don't know the show you just miss it and so yeah that i'm going with that for my quote cool yeah that was a fantastic moment and completely noteworthy so, this has been another episode of Beer with Buffy. Man, I'm I'm feeling a little down now. <laughs> uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Um, if you really, really want to help our show grow, the easiest way to do that is to give us a review on iTunes, uh, where you can send us your review and get a free sticker and also be entered into the next hoodie giveaway. Uh, if you would like to more directly support our show, you can do that in a couple of ways. First, you can buy our merch, beerwithbuffy.com slash shop. Or you can go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash beerwithbuffy, to you know give us your money directly, which we'd very much appreciate. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so in a number of ways. Facebook, Twitter, of course, but you can also give us an email, beerwithbuffy at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call or send a text to our voicemail number, 269-743-0783. And as always, thank you so much to JJ Treadway for all our opening and closing music, although not so much the cat versions. <laughs> this has been another episode of Beer with Buffy. I'm Rex. I'm Josh. Have a good night. Oh, you're cloaca shit. <laughs> Right in the cloaca. <laughs> <laughs>